And yeah, this is the fifth of our uh, lab talks. This is the fifth episode, and it's um, it's sponsored by Cluster Market, so our lab management system that helps labs managing their equipment, um, scheduling, and also maintenance. And we do these talks on various scientific topics just to um, engage with the community. And the scientific reproducibility one, it's one that it's very dear to me, and it's very interesting to to have all of you here. So. I'm your host today. My name is uh, Francisco. I work at Close Markets, and with me today we have um, Karina, Claudio, and Daniele. Just going to introduce yourself, um, the three of you, really quick. Uh, but first of all, thank you very much for your time. And I'll start by Karina. So Karina is uh, currently a researcher at Cranfield University, and she's actually working with biosensors for SARS-CoV-2 detection. And so she has a lot of hands-on uh, experience in the lab, having a bachelor in biomedical science, but also an MRES and global infection diseases. So she's here today to give us a bit of uh, perspective for someone that is currently producing science and also consuming science at the same time. So thanks, Karina. And we have Daniele. So Daniele was one of the first um, natural scientists to dedicate himself to study scientific misconducts. Uh, bias and any related issues. So it's going to be an interesting conversation on that topic as well. And if you look him up, he has produced some of the largest studies in the field. So he's here today to share a bit about uh, his learnings over the past few years. And last but not least, uh, Claudio. Claudio Rolli. So he also uh, was a researcher for several years. So he has a lot of experience in the lab. And he recently founded uh, his own company called Fluix Connect, which is a sample inventory management software um, startup. So it basically helps labs labeling and organizing their samples. So they have everything digitally. So I think we have a very good complete uh, panel to start the conversation. And I'll get the ball rolling. And what I wanted to start with is just to highlighting the facts that the whole topic of today's talk only exists because we are humans and because we have humans, so people doing the research by hand, right? Most of the research is still done manually. So I wanna just highlight that the biases, the mistakes, the misconducts, it only exists because it's, it's a lot of manual work, such as pipetting, counting cells, dissecting animals, executing protocols and so on. So I'll get the ball rolling with Daniele if that's okay. So Daniele, first of all, I have a very interesting question is, why do you find the area so interesting to the point that you have dedicated uh, yourself full time to study it? Uh, well, I could also give you a long story, but I'll give you a, a short story, which I'm sure it's better for the occasion. Uh, fundamentally, because my experience doing a PhD and then I had a, a brief period actually outside academia, tellingly, as a science writer, where in both cases, let's say somewhat disappointing relative to the kind of idealized picture I had of what science um, ought to be and how, how um, up to that point, up to actually entering science, I thought uh, scientific progress occurred. And so it was while I was being a, a journalist, in fact, and so considering in, in some ways a rather different uh, career path that I, I saw people like John Ioannidis and others who were starting to study these issues with research in a scientific way. And I thought that was super interesting. And I already by then realized that I was more of a scientist than a journalist. I enjoyed way, way more sort of going really deep into problems rather than uh, sort of uh, uh, fluttering from one uh, story to the next and so and so there you go I sort of started looking for grants and there was like enough to get one to start doing this work and so this is where I am now and maybe I, the only thing I might add with that is that by now by now that I've spent several years uh, sort of thinking in various matters uh, in various ways around these problems I am less disappointed I'm simply a little bit more realistic and charitable let's say, to the whole scientific enterprise. And this is part of what has become my critique of the uh, sort of reproducibility movements and research integrity movement, let's say. All right, super interesting. So just to follow up on that, Daniele, do you, have you learned over the years that 
is this a crisis? Is this a real crisis? The reproducibility or the replication uh, crisis that people like to uh, claim it as a crisis? Is it really a crisis at all, or is it just the name? Well, again, my short answer, I start with the short answer is no. And I've written about it. And uh, for reasons we might get into later on, I think actually the community is coming around to realizing some of what I was trying to say. Um, the, the slightly longer answer would be, it depends on what we mean. Because of course, you know, science is in a reproducibility crisis, it's just a string of words, a string of symbols that is. So depending on what meaning we ascribe to those words, I could agree to a greater or a lesser extent. But, uh, but again, in my understanding of what people mean, as you hinted in your question, when they say that science is in a crisis, meaning that uh, they uh, sort of some, somewhat we, we are awakening to having plunged ourselves into a problem that we didn't have before, now, and that somehow it is uh, undermining all of science in a, in a profound way, then no, then I disagree in a number of ways that we might discuss. Okay, thank you. And Karina, I'm interested to, to hear from you. If you, as a scientist that is constantly producing your own science, but also reading uh, others, um, other people's work, is this something that you are worried about in your own work in the sense that do you try to make it as reproducible as possible? And do you doubt other people's works when you read it as well? Uh, I do agree with Danielle that it does depend on, you know, what area of science we're talking about, because this, the reproducibility crisis isn't only, um, you know, natural sciences, it's social science, it's medical, and, you know, it goes into very different branches. For my research specifically, unfortunately, because it's COVID, we are having uh, quite a large number of papers that are being published that aren't necessarily reproducible or that they are biased and definitely we need to be questioning and doubting. <laughs> so my, my current approach is I don't just read an article and say, okay, I'm gonna build uh, my, my idea off that article. I actually need to try to reproduce that in order for me to then test my idea. Because you know, right now there's a big problem that they're not really having a lot of time to do all the peer reviews. There's a lot of journals that don't necessarily do peer reviews before publishing. So for my work specifically, it has been a little bit of a problem. You know, we have seen a lot of articles uh, being retracted um, specifically for medications against uh, COVID-19. Uh, and obviously this reproducibility crisis has gotten even bigger when the general public is interested and is trying to read this science. So it makes it a lot harder for you to filter what is good science and what is bad, especially because we're having thousands of articles being published every single day on this one topic. Uh, but my approach is generally, I need to try to do it myself before I can do anything else, unfortunately. That's, that's super interesting. And especially with, with COVID, we, we discussed it on the first episode of, of this series, actually, and that's a major, major issue. But I believe it already existed before in, in other fields as well. And as Daniela, I'm sure, has studied. And what I wanted to ask you is, so when you, when you come across a paper, do you try to validate it with your peers first before you actually engage on trying to replicate it yourself? Or how do you approach this? this doubt that you might or might not have about other people's work? I think the first thing is knowing how to critically read and evaluate science. Um, that is definitely something that we've seen that a lot of people don't know how to do. It is very hard to be critical, uh, but right now, you know, because of COVID-19 being such a big problem, it's very accessible for you to collaborate with other groups and, you know, share protocols and things like that. So the first approach is trying to be as critical as possible. Unfortunately, that is the only way to go when reading it. The next step is I do ask for opinions. There are other uh, COVID-19 researchers in my group. Uh, so I do ask for opinions. Oh, hey, have you read this paper? What did you think? Oh, I have this perspective. What about you? Because sometimes, you know, people can interpret the same thing in 10 different types of ways. So yeah, so besides critically evaluating, it is discussing with other colleagues 
And the third step, if it is in my reach, is actually reproducing the work. Obviously, that's very difficult when they deal with specific samples. So uh, potentially a sample, for example, I'm, I'm testing uh, SARS-CoV-2 in wastewater samples. We know that wastewater samples are collected on a daily basis and potentially there's more COVID cases in the UK than there is in France. So I physically can't work with samples from France, but I can try to reproduce the PCR method that they use, the PCR conditions that they use, and hope that I get something similar. So I do unfortunately have to try to reproduce things if it is within my reach, uh, but there's uh, you know, other things that we can be doing uh, being critical, speaking with other colleagues, and if anything, reaching out to that group and saying, hey, can you explain better how you did this? Did you have any problems? Uh, but yeah, those are the steps that usually I take. Yeah, I found it super interesting and difficult at the same time for a researcher. So when I was in the lab, I had major issues reading protocols that wouldn't specify, for example, what they used to dilute some samples, or what was the speed that they actually centrifuged the samples at. So all these little details, I find that it's super important to be transparent about, but most of the times people just are negligent about it or they don't disclose it on purpose. Uh, I'm not sure about that, but Claudio, do you see any technical solutions in the space helping labs and scientists doing science that it's more reproducible? Um, yeah, I mean, I would say yes. I mean, there is um, like also from my, as you said, I mean, I was a researcher long uh, for, for many years before. And uh, I think what we, uh, I mean, I studied chemistry and then I went more into biology. And I mean, there you already see, I think, um, just like, um, I mean, you, the, the, what you're studying is getting more complex or the, the ability to reproduce, let's say, a, a physics example, like where you just look at light or, uh, I mean, it's really like you can very well define parameters and see what is happening um, in chemistry. I think it's uh, getting a bit more complex with dealing with larger molecules, which sometimes do strange things. Uh, and then if you go to a biological system, uh, humans, animals, uh, I mean, complexity is just increasing. And I think, I mean, this is something we always have to consider and we will not be able to um, solve this with any technology. Uh, so that, that's, uh, but I think what we can uh, tackle with technology is the way how we work in the lab and how uh, we document our uh, experiments. And this is basically the foundation then to also make it available to others and uh, being uh, reviewed by, by or, uh, or reproduced, trying to reproduce it by others. And uh, I mean, today, I mean, with the, with the amount of publications, I mean, and I think it's a, it's a, it would be another topic, but uh the, like how many journals are there and what is uh like just the number of papers in, increasing especially now with COVID I mean I think I'm not on a daily business uh there reading it but I imagine it's just uh I mean you could probably stop working and just reading uh um, journals and new articles that are coming out so you have to find somewhere a balance where uh, where you started I think that you have um, now a, a variety of um, electronic lab notebooks that are around that are, um, yeah, help you to document your experiments, share them with your group first, and then from group with other collaborators. And uh, there's also uh, public um, uh, depositories where, where you can uh, upload, um, I don't know, public, um, yeah, um, experiments or raw data that others can then also work with and analyze it, anal analyze it with different um, yeah, uh, algorithms, let's say. And yeah, I think there is um, the, the electronic lab notebooks, it's something uh, that is there. Uh, then, I mean, of course, we think uh, like, oh, this was my frustration when I went into the lab that still in, in research, so many samples are labeled by hand. And each time I went as a postdoc in, from one lab to another or from, as a student, uh, there's so much know-how. And if the people are not there anymore, it's basically lost information. And you don't know, can we throw it away or not? And uh, not to mention if you want to reproduce or if 
uh, a collaborator asks you for a sample that the PhD student before you did, uh, I mean, you have to really crawl, or oh, that's what we did, crawl basically through the uh, minus uh, 80 freezers or, or liquid nitrogen tanks to, to to try to identify the handwriting of someone else. So, I mean, that's a bit what we are trying to solve. And I think another level is also to um, track the parameters during your experiment, like temperature, humidity, all these environmental um, uh, uh, parameters, which just to give you an example, like I did a lot of live cell imaging, like where you put cells under the microscope and you observe them for um, several hours overnight, over, over days. And I mean, one thing that uh, in, it was an example that I had in my PhD, uh, we, we figured out that the, the air condition of the Institute would uh, 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 decrease its power at, at 10 PM. And that's basically when um, like the cells got out of the, the focus didn't work anymore. Then the temperature, this incubation chamber was not so stable anymore. And, I mean, these are all things that, I mean, experiments are so complex, but if you want to really troubleshoot, um, I think it's, uh, and this is important and there are now tools to to really help you with this. Yeah, I feel like that, that goes back to the way I started this, this episode that we are people, right? And if we were robots or machine and everything was automated, we would just be speeding the data or saving the, the metadata about wherever we, we were doing. but Maybe we we are too tired, or we we don't think it's it's worth recording that piece of information in our ELN or even in a paper notebook, and we just basically leave it. And it's all this adding up to not only one person but millions of scientists all over the world not doing these small things that data gets gets lost. So I, I feel like you're right. It's about the balance between getting the people to record the data, but also giving them the right tools to make their lives as easy as possible to, to be able to record uh, the data properly or as, as much as possible, right? It will never yeah. be perfect as long as you have humans uh, doing the work. But uh, uh, I mean, just what, from my point of view, I mean, I would be curious what maybe what Daniela thinks about it, but I think also like in, the, in recent years, I mean, there has been, uh, I think, awareness also this awareness has been has reached like uh, funding uh, agents like ERC grants or or SNF or uh, like other um, where you when you now apply for a grant you even you're even required to um, fill out like a data um, uh, what is it data management planning uh, document where you say how you plan to record data, how to make it available to the community following these uh, FAIR principles. And um, so I think there is also not only technology available, but also nowadays, I think it's, it's a lucky situation also for researchers that you can consider this as being part of your project and actually get money for it and or time resources. Definitely. Yeah, I think we could stay here forever discussing the flaws of humans, particular and when when performing science. But could, could I add something, however, to what Claudio has said since since he mentioned me? Absolutely. Yeah. Go ahead. Say, I to... So um, uh, first of all, I very much like the the direction that this particular conversation is taking. I would remark how the the kind of problems you're discussing are specific to a certain kind of research you know, whereas part of the problem is when we say oh science is in a reproducibility crisis interestingly we are mostly i mean mostly this this message has been uh, sent at least originally in psychology and in social psychology which are certainly not fields that sort of are as highly codified as the kind of experiments you have in mind and that said um obviously the principle of uh, trying to record um so first of all, so Claudio introduced a, a very key concept here, which is that of complexity. There is certainly some truth in the idea that um, e experiments and the phenomena that we are tackling today are more complex. The two go quite together. Um, this entails that on the one hand, certainly we, we want to have uh, sort of whatever technology we have available to help us 
uh, describe better and in more detail the experiments. Um, but this has already been uh, been argued and showed, and in fact is something that was known for, for decades or even centuries perhaps, that this alone, once you realize that the, the, the challenge you have in front of you is not just the complexity of the methods, but also the phenomena that you're looking at, is not going to be solved, uh, at least not entirely, by just a better codification of the methods. Why? Well, fundamentally, because the more you're dealing with complex phenomena, the more they're going to be unknown unknowns that, by definition, you're unable to record and control for. And this is not just likely to introduce noise in your data, but following a, a phenomenon that, again, was certainly known for decades, if not uh, longer, uh, which is that of uh, reaction norms, where a phenotype, for example, would um, uh, would uh, would be modulated by some environmental factor, and again, let's let's posit that that factor is not something one is aware of. Then, um, paradoxically, improving the precision on every other aspect of the experiment is all is only going to make matters worse. It's only going to make the replication from another lab of the same experiment uh, uh, look more disappointing, like so sort of yielding uh, contradictory results. This again has been argued not by me, but, uh, but by others, it has been defined as the reproducibility paradox. And this, for example, is one of those elements in this whole conversation that is easily forgotten. So once more, uh, I'm all for, uh, for developing new and better ways to, to qualify an experiment. But just controlling the factors per se is not necessarily going to improve reproducibility. It might, might, might paradoxically make matters worse. And in fact, another very interesting line of, um, of a sort of scientific methodology that has tried successfully, it would seem, to tackle some issues that were known about the, the sort of the apparent reproducibility of results across lab, labs was paradoxically consisting in doing, in a sense, the opposite i.e. introducing variability in one's experiments, introducing deliberately noise such that the model one is looking at essentially is going to be uh, in its response more resilient. And so just to say that again, in the direction that we are obviously taking of having a science of reproducibility, the answers are not just as simple as having better methods and more accurate reporting. Yeah, that, I, I agree. That makes total sense, Daniele. Thanks for the for the comments. Uh, I was going to say that I wanted to switch gears, but I'm not actually switching gears. I'm just I want to explore more the concept of scientific uh, bias, in the sense of not only the people that are producing the science, but also the people that judge the science. So publication biases, citation biases, even the peer reviewing biases. So Daniele, I don't know if you want to take this one. Um, and just start exploring it. But I would like first to just explain to people what is what is the scientific bias? What do you understand by scientific bias? Well, again, it is one of those loaded terms that could be taken in a number of directions. I, I think the, uh, the general intuition behind any idea of bias is that there is a truth of the matter and uh, some process that could be mechanical or well in some ways it's always mechanical but you know whether the mechanism has to do with the, the sort of the core methodology or what's inside someone's mind consciously or unconsciously but in any case there is some intervening mechanism that sort of uh, skews the results away from that ideal uh, fact of the matter um so already already having said that these uh, the, the the definition in this way I would submit, given the enormous differences we have across disciplines, for example, in the kind of complexity and generality of the phenomena that are being analyzed, that the extent to which this assumption that there is a truth of the matter there, a sort of a fixed effect that any single study is sort of sampling and trying to, to estimate, is, is, is questionable. It might be uh, arguably uh, true in, uh, in uh, some areas of physics, in fact, but pretty much you know, as we move uh, along the the, the hierarchy of complexity of phenomena in the world, this becomes less becomes less and less true. So it becomes a question in and of itself as to exactly what one is trying to replicate in a study, for example. And so, 
Uh, and so in, in what way can one say that biases are being introduced? Now, there the matter would become quite complex, but a simple way to understand um, uh, to understand what, what we might mean, again, in generally speaking by complexity, is, uh, has to do with, with something immediately measurable as the size of the effect. So the, the more noise there is in your measurements, the more any kind of standardized measure, standardized based on the noise, the standard deviation or whatever you might be using, will be smaller, right? So this is a very simplistic uh, way to capture this idea that you, one is dealing with something that is very complex. Well, this is matter of, of recent research. Again, I've been arguing this for a while. Maybe I didn't make much a strong quantitative argument, but I've seen people now starting to work on simulations, um, showing that basically uh, whatever we define in terms of these QRPs, we, these would be the questionable research practices which introduce bias, we think, uh, uh, due to, uh, to the human factor, in a sense, consciously, unconsciously, right? Well, those appear to have a lesser effect, you know, a, a lesser sort of causative effect on irreproducibility than the magnitude of the effect one is looking at. Because again, in reality, much of the problem with reproducibility, I would contend, has to do with the complexity of the phenomena. And to some extent, what appears to be a bias at times, in the sense that it appears to be an arbitrary decision made by a researcher to go one way rather than another in an experiment, is actually the reflection of the expertise of, of the, the uh, researcher that, um, uh, 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 based on experience or perhaps intuition or perhaps lack, who knows, but is somewhat overcoming some of these uh, factors that are hard to control otherwise. Um, so just, just to uh, summarize, I apologize maybe if I've gone a little too long on this answer, but basically when we talk about bias, there is a statistical concept of bias and just the skew of a result versus some truth of the matter. In the context of reproducibility, and rather unfortunately I would add, this idea of bias is almost conflated with the idea of questionable research practices or other forms of sort of unconscious biases in how a study is designed, et cetera, that are sort of just um, uh, set in place to obtain a certain result rather than an unbiased result. Now, without saying that these uh, aren't sometimes at least a problem in research, and certainly are, are practices that to any extent that they do occur, we want to avoid, uh, again, the connection that uh, I always hear sort of made quite immediately between reproducibility issues and bias in, in research is not as direct as one might assume. Yeah, I feel like the the, the topic is so, so complex. It's, it's like the phenomena that uh, the scientists are studying, the, the concept of biases and reproducibility, it's also complex itself. But I wanna I wanna explore a bit more about what you mentioned about someone who is more experienced and it might go into one direction when compared to someone that is less experienced. So I wanna ask Karina actually, Karina, do you feel like when you're making decisions on which direction to go with your own research or which protocol to apply or which technical things sometimes are really just minor things that you would do on your own? But if you have someone senior in the lab. And if you ask them for their opinion, they would have completely opposite um, direction that they would prefer to go. Do you feel like that affects already the research you do? Yes, it does. Um, so taking in consideration other people's opinions can definitely change the direction you're going in. Um, and I, I mean, it's important to go for other opinions, especially when it's a, a situation when you're dealing with something that's so new like COVID when you need uh, other opinions because you know it's it's a situation that we need all hands on deck. Uh, but speaking specifically about protocols, uh, I particularly like going on a, a website called Protocol.io uh, where people are updating and you know uploading protocols on many different experiments and you can physically see how many people have seen this protocol and people vote saying this has worked for me or this has 
you know, what protocols I should be using. I quite like to go for the protocols that I've seen has worked for several other people and things that are very specific. So if I'm going to go for, for example, a PCR protocol, I need it to be very specific to uh, an RNA virus, not necessarily bacteria, because, you know, it could be completely different or uh, a protocol that's using the same type of reagents that, uh, that I'm using. Right now, there's so many different types of kits that you can be using for RNA extraction for PCR. So you really want to keep it as uniform as possible uh, when trying to reproduce. Uh, so yeah, uh, and going back to the, to the question when you, when you ask for other people's opinions, it depends. I do, I am naturally a very curious person. So if I feel like maybe something is worth investigating, I will go and I will investigate that. Uh, but yes, I do take into consideration other people's opinions because I am human. I can be wrong. And science, you know, we learn a lot more from negative results than we do from positive results. Uh, it is unfortunate that negative results rarely are published. And um, that brings me to something else. So when, when we go to publish, for example, uh, we can be a little bit biased, uh, in, you know, not, not on purpose, but we are picking and choosing what experiments we are publishing because we have, you know, maybe a word count that we need to meet for publishing. Maybe it's uh, some experiments that gave me an idea but aren't entirely relevant to the paper I'm publishing. So I'll have to pick and choose. And, you know, that can, that can lead to another problem. But what I, I particularly like in, um, you know, the, the field I'm in is that we have such you know, great access to other people. Like we can so quickly drop them an email and say, hey, I read your paper, I found it really interesting, but I found a hard time understanding this or I tried to redo it and it was wrong. And in most cases, from my experience, people are quite nice and they respond in like a timely manner and really help you, you know, try to troubleshoot your problems. Um, hope that answers that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh feel like our own opinion is already influenced by other people's opinions so we don't really have like a true opinion that it's just our own so it's always biased from from the get-go uh, but I want to go into the publication biases now that you mentioned the negative and the positive results that's something super super interesting and I think you mentioned it that we learn more from the negative than than the positive ones and I just want to touch on that and anyone feel free to comment on that. And uh, so obviously people are, the incentives is just, they are wrong, right? Because they incentive people to just publish what works and what doesn't, people don't really care because you don't get paid for that. You don't, don't get grants for that. You don't progress in your career if you publish anything that hasn't worked. So do you think the, the key here would be to change the incentives around it? Or is that is there any other way you see things changing for the better. I'd like to comment on that. Yeah. Uh, it's very complicated because right now it's exactly as you said, for you to be able to, you know, grow in your career, especially if you're within academia, is through publishing. So people will go to crazy extents just to, to publish, not necessarily even, pay, you know, choosing a high impact journal um, maybe even going for predatory journals just to have a publication. Um, I do feel that it is backwards. I haven't been in research for very long. Uh, I still have a long way ahead of me. However, a couple of years ago, about 10 years ago, when I was thinking about going into science, I had the impression that it was you get paid when you publish. When I got into science, I was very wrong. <laughs> Uh, and I don't say that this is how it necessarily should be, but we should be changing the way we react to if you don't have a publication, if you do, um, what the impact factor is of a journal, because that doesn't necessarily mean it's a good journal. We have really big impact journals that you know are, are having to retract papers every single year, that publish papers that are um, you know extremely con controversial in several different areas. Uh, so I do think that we need to find a way maybe to change um, how science currently is in terms of publications. Uh, personally, I don't really have anything to recommend. Uh, I'm trying to figure it out myself, to be honest. 
Uh, Daniela, do you, do you want to say something on this? Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I guess I'll take again a little bit the 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 position of sort of the, the devil's advocate, if you like, uh, which I guess has, has become my role uh, because it, it it is part of how I've I've learned to understand this matter matters. Um, in, a, in a more complex way, because again, complex, complexity here is the key. I think in principle, we all agree. So first of all, again, that the, the system of incentives uh, it seems, let's say, frustratingly inefficient, to say the least, if not openly unfair. And that um, at least in principle, again, uh, the idea that a negative, a negative result uh, can be very informative and therefore should be published is, is uh, sort of to be endorsed. Then in practice, again, the extent to which there is information value in a negative result varies, that has to vary by field enormously. And it's probably, it goes beyond sort of just thinking about disciplines or methodologies. It's probably a matter on a case by case basis because, and I think this is quite intuitive, the extent to which someone who tried an experiment and did not sort of see any effect at all, let's say, uh, uh, is, is giving you some useful information it has to do to the extent to which you can count on sort of every single step of that experiment being valid and validly performed and um, uh, and therefore being able again to pull out from that experiment some kind of information about what will make the experiment not work and and even in that case you know thinking about complexity if the issue behind an experiment, uh, let's call it failing in the sense of not showing any effect, has to do with any one of the innumerable passages in a very complex methodology, uh, again, not being done the way they should. And I'm not talking about the incompetence of the researcher, but again, for example, in the fact that there is a variable that ought to be controlled for and, uh, and that wasn't. And let's say that we don't know about it, so no one is reporting it. Then, um, that piece of evidence, whereas you could still argue it's giving you some information, it's going to have a cost. And here again, I'm going to, 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 to quote people that have made similar arguments. So this is not just sort of me uh, arguing in this way. But there is, if on the one hand, there is definitely a file drawer problem, which is what we're talking about here, the idea that um, you, you try something out, it doesn't work, and you don't bother for various reasons uh, to publish it at all, and it stays in the metaphorical file drawer. There is what uh, other researchers have called the cluttered office problem, which is if everybody publishes every single piece of irrelevant research, uh, even redundant research, even positive results, but that are actually just redundant, um, we have sort of what is still arguably a complexity problem that has to do with the search time but it would take anyone, any scientist, to find the information that is really useful to make progress. And so again, at least at a systemic level, there is, for example, a trade-off to be considered between how, how much we really want to incentivize people to just publish any single thing they have. And the last in fact, the comment, it's quite interesting that you, Francisco, uh, phrased the, the question, um, so sort of the last time that you were sort of uh, uh, posing this issue as publishing an experiment that worked. Because if that's what you intend, so a, a null result is something that doesn't work, then I'm not necessarily sure it is that terribly informative. Well, I mean, at least it's quite logical to, uh, uh, to find interest in something that actually works. If the issue, however, is that you are, you are systematically using well-codified methodologies, for example, in a phenomenon that is awash with noise, and that would be the case of clinical research, for example, where all this, this, uh, this kind of discourse of, of publication bias actually started from, and it has been unfortunately exported uh, uh, verbatim virtually in other fields. Uh, well, then indeed you have sort of a classic problem of publication bias. And so again, we, we talk of publication bias in this way, in my understanding, primarily because in clinical research, you have clinical trials, which are very, very strongly codified. They're almost as as perfect an experiment as you can imagine in biology. They're dealing with a lot of noise and they also have often financial interest or other sort of you know, interests of various kinds. And therefore there is a well-known and, and sort of well-measured and, and partially, only partially tackled problem with no, no negative results not being published. The extent to which the same idea translates elsewhere 
it needs to be, as I said at the beginning, evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. Again, one cannot sort of make too, uh, too simplistic an argument. Again, I've played devil's advocate again. No, yeah, that makes it. Uh, Claudio, do you, do you have any comments on this from your days in the lab? How do you feel like your work was affected by biases in the, in the papers you published or in how you were, I'm not sure if you had the chance to review other people's papers and if you feel like you were under the influence of some sort of biases when, when doing so. Are you muted? Yeah, sorry, now I'm here. Um, well, I, I would also agree. I mean, you, you have your background, uh, the university where you studied, uh, people you met on conferences, uh, met in person, had discussions with. I mean, this is always like giving you a stronger, stay stronger in your mind than maybe something that is has been published already 20 years before, years before your research and uh, you, you, you wouldn't even come across um, a very interesting point uh, uh, in uh, like considering it even, yeah, like that it uh, could be interesting. Um, um, yeah, I mean, I, like myself, I was more like in, a lot like in, in, in biophysics or like looking for single cells. I mean, but I think it's everywhere. I mean, experiments are very tedious. You have to prepare them. There's many things on the way. Um, and you can also, I mean, there's sometimes you say, okay, now the samples are like already in the preparation set, maybe you discard it and maybe it was not that bad but it you 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 just discarded it already because you have some intention like it, it should come with something and you might be filtering something out on the way i think um yeah there, there's i think there are these biases i mean what, what i found interesting what daniela said like to go uh, to, to introduce this uh, let's say uh, some some stochastic noise um, um and see what's happening and i think this is something that, I mean, just recently I read um, a little article um, where people uh, followed up the, um, let's say what, what, what nature has described as this reproducibility crisis. I mean, there, there's like a, a whole series of publications and there's, it's a, a Brazilian group uh, where they tried different locations to reproduce the experiment it's only in Brazil, but different places. and. There is no not uh, the final publication out yet, but uh, what I found interesting is already the like the, the mid result and basically the the authors advocating or proposing um, kind of stopping this idea of now I publish something and this is now a truth and this is now the new uh, let's say uh, textbook. Um, uh, result, but like to really have start first. Uh, a discussion in the community and um, yeah, especially if it's something really new to have have it really double checked by other people and having ha having having seen it. And, uh, but I think, yeah, there again, we get in conflict with uh, you as a PhD student, you need your publications. I mean, you say you don't want to wait uh, five years until, uh, or, or even 10 years until um, other <laughs> generations have, have gone through it. But I think, think uh, like the what is here um, interesting also to have like open archives where you can discuss results or like with uh, protocols IO where you have a platform where you can um, share um, I mean you, you basically why it's a possibility to widen your network and you not to be only that is isolated on that um, very niche that at the end, most scientists, I mean, you are always in your daily work, you're in a very niche. So there's always like, um, maybe now with COVID a little bit different if you're in that, but normally, I mean, it's it's a few few expert labs around the world. And if, if, if they, they can already connect to each other, I think this would be very valuable. Um, but there again, I mean, there's also rivalities. And uh, so it's not, all, I mean, it's also a bit wishful thinking. It will not always work, but I think it's uh, this should be definitely encouraged. 
I'd like to add on to that as well. Um, so besides protocol IO, for example, ResearchGate is quite helpful. Um, as I mentioned, it's quite hard for you to find papers that are publishing negative results uh, for obvious reasons. They, like Danielle said, they, they aren't always going to be as helpful as we imagine they are. Um, so ResearchGate is a good option for that as well. I tend to, to see people saying, hey, this went wrong with my experiment. Has anyone else encountered this? And that tends to help me very, very much, especially now during COVID. Um, and as Claudia mentioned as well, as a PhD student, you know, your goal is to publish and, you know, you're, you're really into that. That is one of your main goals, especially in the first and second year, is to get at least a literature review out. Uh, and even more now, working on COVID, when things are being, you know, published at so, such a rapid rate, you want to be the first. Uh, so currently my work is on the variants uh, and what I am doing, we do know that other groups are doing similar work. So we're in a very, you know, short time where we need to do these experiments and try to publish them and still try to focus on, you know, getting them right, not, not being biased, you know, making sure that they're reproducible, getting other lab members to maybe do this research, getting other opinions. So it is a very complex and, you know, situation to be in. Um, but there are, you know, there's many things that we can do to try to reduce this so-called crisis, uh, but I definitely don't think it's going to just go away. It's something that we will forever have in science, unfortunately. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, and I feel like all these external factors that are not entirely related to the research itself, but they affect the humans that are doing the research, those are basically the causes behind not the crisis, but all the issues that we have been discussing. So I want to aggravate all these factors to the point that someone would actually commit a misconduct on, on purpose. So I want to touch on misconduct and um, retraction before we, we end the, the conversation, uh, which is it's long already. So I want to just First of all, uh, maybe Danielle, you would be the best to allow us uh, distinguish to a distinction between misconducts and reproducibility issues. So, where does one draw the line between something not done on purpose or something that was done on purpose? Uh, so, I, I would actually separate them even more because. Uh... Uh, all right, let, let's uh, let's go with order. So, first of all, misconduct. When we talk about misconduct, by now that is sort of the technical term that we use to indicate uh, inappropriate uh, behavior, well, egregiously inappropriate behavior in research. That are by now uh, set standards um, around the world that typically include a core definition of what one would sort of more colloquially define as scientific fraud is, and that is fabricating data, so making up your data set entirely, uh, falsifying data, which is sort of more subtly, but again, uh, very deliberately messaging effectively your methods or results or selecting them in ways that we said sometimes might happen sort of benignly, but um, in order, again, to, to mislead fundamentally your readers about what the actual results that you have, your data here really looks like. And then there's plagiarism. Um, so that is the core, core, uh, the core FFP uh, triptych. Now, um, there are, depending in the, now on the policies, on the countries, sometimes on the institutions even, sort of a, a broader range of QRPs that we mentioned before, questionable research practices of various kinds that, again, are understood to be somewhere in the space of maybe arbitrary, maybe sort of bias, maybe actually legitimate choices that are very, very hard to pin down and typically are not considered, um, uh, again, sort of uh, fraudulent or egregious in that sense. And so in, in, in pretty much all policies, there is a distinction drawn between, again, what is an intention, intentional act to deceive people and that would be uh, misconduct by any standard. And again, sort of the, the whole messiness of doing research and being a better or a worse scientist perhaps as well. Now, you mentioned reproducibility and I don't know if it was a, a, a lapsus or you actually meant it, but again, 
even though there is obvious an obvious overlap between these concepts, again, it's quite important to keep them separate for a number of reasons. Uh, not least the fact that paradoxically, again, if you like, uh, it has often been the case that it results that were entirely fabricated, so entirely made up studies would actually replicate very well because, you know, due to the intuition, I suppose, of the of the authors who were making up their results, they knew that there was some there there. It's just that, you know, maybe their experiment had gone wrong. They needed the publication nonetheless, so they resorted to remassaging their data until they obtained the results that they knew they should have got. So again, it, 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 it's very, very uh, healthy, I think, to just keep these concepts separate. Another thing to mention with regards to, to retractions is that uh, retractions, again, are, are best kept separate from all of these masses, because increasingly nowadays, a lot of retractions are actually um, um, caused by uh, nothing to do with misconduct, uh, nothing to do even with reproducibility. Often it is matters that have to do maybe with uh, ethical breaches or, or issues that have to do with, uh, uh, I don't know, just mentioned some cases, you know, failure to publish the publication fees or things like that. So the retract retractions are a very important tool that we have to help science self-correct, no doubt about it. Um, but again, it is a tool that we can use or not in this space in a variety of different ways. That's that's super interesting. I was fascinated to hear that fabricated results could be reproducible. But I mean, it kind of makes sense to some extent, uh, especially if you know what you're talking about or you know it's possible, but you haven't exactly been able to, to do it. So maybe someone else will. So it kind of works in a positive way, even though the primary action that you took was actually not very positive for, for the community. Um, but in terms of retraction, would you not, maybe we shouldn't mention retraction, but would you consider maybe Karina or Claudio, would you consider retraction for results that are not reproducible? So results that are proven to not be reproducible should those be retracted or should they still be out there as some sort of scientific uh, proof of what doesn't work or what is not reproducible? I think you're muted, Claudio. Again. Yeah, I think um, just, uh, uh, yeah, I'm not the expert here to talk to, but I mean, I think, like, I mean, these cases, I mean, I think it's important not to, retract them completely like in a way that uh, they're all like trying to hide it as if they were never published but really to to make a point and I mean this is I think what we discussed also earlier uh, like let's say a negative result is uh, where you would assume where I would assume at least like this is at least someone has put a lot of effort in doing it and it might um, show people that maybe this way of thinking or like trying to get this kind of result out of something that that this doesn't work so i think that's really like uh, i mean you have to to learn from mistakes if you don't if you just try to to hide them away i mean there is no way other generations on of uh, can learn from it i think daniela you wanted to say something uh but i think Karina wanted to go as well. I don't want to. Okay, well, because the the again, sort of the, the distinction here that I would uh, draw again is uh, is is between um, uh, an experiment that appear that that sort of other people are unable to reproduce, and the idea that either it was fraudulent or that. Uh, in any case, it doesn't work. Like sort of, it's false. Because for all the reasons that we said before, that is not necessarily the case. And so, if there is an argument, as we said, that at least in some fields, one would want all those negative results there because they might be informative about how to make that same result work. Then, again, we, we set the completely wrong incentives if, if we conclude that uh, once an experiment appears to be to not be reproduced successfully by other people, we should sort of get rid of it from the literature. And so, my personal answer to that would be an absolute no. And conversely, however, even if a study reproduces perfectly, but we know that it was fraudulent, which we said can happen, then absolutely, yes, that should be retracted and it should not be cited. It should not be yeah. an official part of the literature because you want to punish 
people for doing what is the the most heinous crime in science, really. I'd like to add on to that as well. So I agree 100%. If it is something that is fraudulent, yes, we need to actually take that down. Uh, it can lead to, or if you're going to leave it up, at least have some type of advisory uh, request that, you know, the authors put some type of advisory link or, or even the, the journal itself saying that some of this may, may be fraudulent or et cetera. Uh, but when it's not, and it's something that's just not reproducible, for example, going back to what I'm doing, a lot of the PCR primers that we used at the beginning of the, of the pandemic no longer work because there's novel variants appearing, appearing. Does that mean that all the scientific literature that was published last year needs to be retracted because it's no longer reproducible? No, because we learned from that. That's something that's super important for us to, to go back, read and see what we did um, to adapt to certain, to certain situations. So retractions are good and bad. It just depends on what type of literature it is, what type of data. Um, and what was the error? Was it, is it something that's just changed so much that it's no longer reproducible? Is it you know, a paper from the, the 90s that unfortunately isn't something that we really do anymore? Or is it something that was actually made up? So uh, I agree with retraction as long as it's something that is uh, fraudulent and can potentially impact negatively you know, future studies on that topic. Amazing, yeah. I, I think this is the perfect point to wrap up the conversation. So uh, I think we touched on very, very interesting topics and we're ending on a kind of a good bad note with a retraction topic, but I think we, we got the right answers from from everyone on the on the talk today. So I I would like to thank Karina, Claudio, and Daniela for your for your time and for your contribution to the conversation. And again, this was a pleasure to hosts. Uh, we're going to have more of these in case you're interested in in different topics. And the the whole conversation will also be available online um, in audio and video. So. If you're interested to check it out or just share it with your friends and colleagues, um, you can also do that. From my side, thank you very much, guys. It was a pleasure. Have a, a lovely evening. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yes, it was a lot of fun. And it was great. Yeah. Thank you. Have a nice evening. Thank you, guys. Bye. Cheers. Thank you very Bye. much. Bye-bye.